As a weird kid growing up in the 80s, I have to say that Unsolved Mysteries gave me completely unrealistic expectations about the frequency of cases of amnesia and spontaneous human combustion. All kidding aside, if you were into the strange and unusual around that time, one of the things you would always see in some weird book was the half-burned remains of a person with only the bottom portion of the leg still recognizable. There were two pictures that were the most popular, Dr. John Irving Bentley and Helen Conway. Both Dr. Bentley and Helen Conway died in the 1960s, but prior to their strange deaths, a woman named Mary Hardy Reeser died under similar circumstances in July 1951. The difference between her death and theirs from a researcher's perspective is that it was covered much more in depth in the papers. Join me as we explore the strange death of Mary Hardy Reeser. Mary Hardy Reeser was a 67-year-old widow who had moved to St. Petersburg, Florida from Columbia, Pennsylvania following the death of her husband a few years prior. Her son, like his father had been, was a prominent physician in the area. Mary lived in a fairly new furnished apartment located at 1200 Cherry Street Northeast in the exclusive Northeast section of St. Petersburg. She lived in apartment number one of the All Amanda apartment building, which is the left corner apartment. It was described as being thoroughly modern. Each apartment in the five unit building had a living room, electric kitchen, twin bed bedroom, tiled bath, and a garage. Three of the five units were empty and the only other person living in the building was Mary's landlord, Pansy M. Carpenter. Around 5 a.m. on Monday, July 2nd, Pansy was woken up by what she described as a dull thud. She told investigators that it sounded like a door closing. She got up, looked around outside, but saw nothing unusual and headed back in. As she got to her apartment, she thought she smelled smoke and went into her garage to turn off an electric pump that had been causing her problems. Around 6 a.m., she got back up to get the paper and thought it was strange that Mary was not up and listening to her radio as she typically did each morning. Pansy said at this time she didn't see or smell any smoke. About 8 a.m., a Western Union employee came with a telegram for Mary and asked Pansy what apartment she was in. Pansy told him she would deliver the telegram as she also had the paper to bring to Mary. When she went to open Mary's screen door, she felt it was hot and hollered at the telegram man to help her. She would later tell police the screen door was unlocked. When the Western Union employee didn't respond, Pansy hollered at some painters working across the street and told them there was a woman inside the apartment. The two men went into Mary's apartment as Pansy went back to her own apartment to call the fire department, as well as Mary's son, Dr. Reeser. The first man looked into the apartment from the doorway and could see no one lying on the bed, although the bed looked like it had been slept in. The second man entered and went through the entire apartment before he saw Mary's remains on his way out. He told investigators when he entered the apartment there was very little fire, but a lot of smoke. All he could see of Mary's body was the lower part of one leg and a black slipper. He noticed that the ceiling light was on in the dressing room, and when he tried to turn it off, he saw the faceplate was melted and he was afraid to touch it. Both men would later tell investigators that the heat was not what they would consider intense. When the fire department arrived on scene, they remarked that the inside of the apartment was filled with smoke and the assistant fire chief entered to open the windows to allow the smoke to escape. The smoldering mass on the floor was put out with a hand pump. Like the men before him, the fire chief didn't see what remained of Mary's body until he was making his way out of the apartment. The fire chief was completely stunned by the scene he found. All of the electrical outlets were working fine, though most were slightly melted. The switch that was nearest to where Mary had been was completely melted and not working. An electric clock in the room had stopped at 420, but when it was plugged in at Pansy's apartment, it worked fine. The facts of the case were quickly released to the papers. Number one, the corner where Mary's body was found was hot enough to destroy her body and most of the chair, but the paint on the wall behind her was not cracked or scorched. Number two, the living room rug was burned, but only underneath where Mary's chair had been. Number three, soot and smoke blackened the upper walls and ceiling of the room, but there was no evidence of smoke near the floor or below table level. Number four, light switches melted and buckled, 
but outlets a few feet lower on the walls were intact and working. Number five. Candles on a windowsill near the hot corner had melted, but their wicks remained upright in their holders. Number six. A pile of newspapers on a water heater immediately behind the hot corner were undamaged. Number seven. Bed sheets a few feet away were not burned, smoke damaged, or dirty. Number eight. All electricity to the kitchen was off. Number nine. The wall-mounted gas heater was secured and off. Different theories began to spread about the cause of the fire. One of the more prominent was that Mary had been struck by lightning. Shortly after her death, police received an unsigned letter that was addressed to the chief of detectives, which said, quote, a ball of fire came through the open window and hit her. I seen it happen. Another theory was that her body must have been soaked in ether or alcohol. The police even went so far as to contact the company that manufactured the chair Mary had been sitting in to see what they used to stuff the chair. Perhaps for some reason it had been stuffed with a highly flammable material. They were told it was stuffed with sterilized cotton batting. A Tampa Tribune reporter, whose son recently released an awesome podcast episode about this story, I'll put a link in the description, checked Mary's medicine cabinet and only found, quote, standard digestive aids. Every possible angle was explored and left police and fire investigators completely baffled. Mary's remains were fairly quickly released to the funeral home for burial, although the death certificate remained unsigned. Police tried to put together a timeline of Mary's last moments as best they could. They questioned her son, Dr. Richard Reeser Jr. and Pansy Carpenter as they were the people said to have seen Mary last. It was said that Mary's day revolved around her son. She was known to get up before 6 a.m. and listen to the radio while washing her clothes or doing other chores around the apartment. She would normally eat breakfast around 7 or 8 a.m. and then wait for Dr. Reeser to come over for his morning cup of coffee around 10. She would then leave to do various errands for Dr. Reeser and return home around 4 p.m. She would take a nap until dinner time, which she almost always ate at her son's house. By 8 p.m., she was typically back at her apartment listening to the radio until it was time to go to sleep. Pansy said that on Sunday, July 1st, Mary came home around 4.30 p.m. and appeared upset. Her daughter-in-law came over around 5, 5.30 p.m. and stayed for a short visit. Around 8 p.m., Dr. Reeser stopped by only for a few minutes. Pansy spoke to Mary very briefly either before Dr. Reeser arrived or just after he had left. She said that Mary was wearing a rayon nightgown and black satin shoes. Mary told Pansy she was a little upset and had taken two Secanol tablets and would take two more a little later. Pansy believed Mary was upset by a family quarrel, but it would later be said she was disappointed about taking a trip to Pennsylvania. The telegram that would arrive the following day and lead to the discovery of Mary's remains was from a friend in Pennsylvania letting her know that her trip had been arranged and taken care of. On July 7, 1951, St. Petersburg police sent 14 pieces of evidence to the FBI lab. Included in the evidence were glass fragments, six small objects believed to be teeth, metal from near the body, fibers from what they believed was Mary's nightgown, bone fragments, cotton from the chair, charred wood, charred legs from the end table, a piece of the rug, an unburned section of the rug, quote, heavily soaked with greasy substance ashes, a shoe, and chair springs. Interestingly enough, J. Edgar Hoover was directly involved with the investigation into Mary's death. The chief of police, J.R. Reichert, specifically requested that the FBI provide any information or theories into how a human body could be so destroyed and the fire contained to such a small area with so little damage done to the building and furniture in the room. On July 31st, 1951, the long-awaited FBI report was released. The results were that no accelerants were found and the greasy substance submitted was body fat. They stated the lack of widespread damage in the apartment was most likely due to the fire smoldering rather than burning. The hot air rose and formed a layer which never came into contact with items below the four-foot level. The FBI believed that the piece of metal found near the body was most likely the remains of a cigarette lighter. The final result of the report was that Mary most likely accidentally lit herself on fire 
while smoking a cigarette. Mary's death certificate was finally signed following the release of the FBI report. The cause of death was listed as accidental. The wick effect is the most current explanation for cases of spontaneous human combustion. Basically, after a person has caught fire, they are kept burning by their own body fat. The clothing on the body acts as the wick, sort of like an inside-out candle. Because it is typically a slow burn, nothing other than the items in the immediate area are affected. I have to believe that the FBI got it right, and Mary's death was caused by a combination of sedatives and falling asleep with a lit cigarette. However, I have so many unanswered questions. Can someone be so passed out that they can't wake up even when they're on fire? If she did wake up on fire, why didn't Pansy hear her scream? If the thud that Pansy heard around 5 a.m. was Mary's chair collapsing, is it possible for her entire body to have been reduced to ash in a period of three to four hours? At the time, there were rumors that Mary had gotten into an argument with her daughter-in-law, who interestingly enough, we never really get to hear much about from the police reports and newspaper articles. This is just one of those strange cases that will always leave people scratching their heads. And that brings us to the end of the strange death of Mary Hardy Reeser. I would love to know what you think in the comments. As always, I'm Jennifer Jones. See you next time.